गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन माई नेम इज़ अनवय एंड आई विल बी योर होस्ट फॉर दिस इवनिंग अ वेरी वॉम वेलकम टू ऑल ऑफ यू हैव टेकन टाइम आउट टू कम एंड अटेंड दिस इन्फोसिस प्राइज लेक्चर आई वुड लाइक टू वॉमली वेलकम अ डिस्टिंग्विश स्पीकर प्रोफेसर यमुना कृष्णन आर एस्टीम डायरेक्टर प्रोफेसर देवांग खक्कर डिप्यूटी डायरेक्टर्स प्रोफेसर प्रसन्ना मुजुमदार एंड प्रोफेसर ए के सुरेश आर डीन फॉर एलुमना एंड कॉर्पोरेट रिलेशन प्रोफेसर सुहास जोशी डीन फॉर फैकल्टी अफेयर्स प्रोफेसर कलियप्पन डीन फॉर इंटरनेशनल रिलेशन्स प्रोफेसर स्वाति पाटनकर रिस्पेक्टेड फैकल्टी मेम्बर्स स्टाफ एंड माई फेलो स्टूडेंट्स बिफोर वी प्रोसीड टू द इंट्रोडक्शन ऑफ अर डिस्टिंग स्पीकर आई वुड लाइक टू रिक्वेस्ट अर डायरेक्टर प्रोफेसर खक्कर टू वेलकम प्रोफेसर यमुना कृष्णन विद अ फ्लोरल बुके Moving on to the first part of this lecture, I would like to invite Professor B. Sunoj on stage to introduce Professor Yamuna Krishnan, and her lecture on DNA nanotechnology enters the world of precision medicine to our audience. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's indeed my great pleasure to introduce my long-time friend Yamuna. Uh, before I move into the formal part of the introduction, I must uh, tell you that uh, we have played cricket together. and i'm not going to elaborate any further to avoid further embarrassment for you uh, so let me uh, read out for the benefit of students uh, who she is and what she has been doing uh, emina is currently a professor at department of chemistry university of chicago uh, a recognized leader in the field of self assembled nucleic acid nanostructures her research encompasses nucleic acid structure and dynamics nucleic acid nanotechnology and cellular and subcellular technologies and most of this is above my head so i will not elaborate any further on your technical skills uh, she received her uh, bsc degree from university of madras followed by uh, integrated phd that includes ms and phd from indian institute of science bangalore that was the time uh, i have met her and uh, professor santosh karpure who is in the audience we were batchmates doing assignments together uh, during the course work uh, at iisc bangalore Uh, she uh, subsequently moved on uh, to cambridge university uh, under the scheme of uh, royal commission for exhibition of 1851 uh, he uh, she worked there as a postdoctoral researcher and subsequently she joined the national center for biological sciences in bangalore uh, in 2005 as a fellow and quickly became a reader and then an associate professor before she moved to uh, university of chicago in the year 2014 Her research went from strength to strength, attracting numerous awards, uh, including Innovative Young Biotechnologist Award in the year 2007, Wellcome Trust DBT Alliance Senior Research Research Award in 2010, and YIM Boston Young Scientist Award in 2012, and Shanti Swaroop Padmanagar Prize in 2013. Uh, she had done a lot of research work uh, that led to Infosys Prize, in particular. Infosys Prize for the year 2017 was awarded to Yamuna uh, in Physical Sciences uh, for her groundbreaking work in the emerging field of architecture of architecture of building blocks of life, the DNA, by successfully manipulating DNA to create biocompatible nano machines. She has created novel ways of interrogating living systems, increasing our knowledge of cell function, and getting. one step closer to answering unresolved biomedical uh, questions and with this brief uh, words i warmly welcome emina to deliver her lecture emina so noj thank you so much for that kind introduction and in return for reading out all my awards i am going to tell people exactly how that cricket match turned out so uh sunoj so since you embarrass me i get to embarrass you uh so uh sunoj was the best batsman uh, uh in chemistry uh, in indian institute of science um and uh, i came to bowl for the opposition and uh, sunoj was first ball middle stump fell down uh <laughs> so <laughs> that is also on my cv but you didn't read that out uh, <laughs> okay so it's really a pleasure to uh, to be here uh, iit bombay i think is a household name for all indians uh and uh, no wonder uh, because of the uh, extraordinary caliber of uh, young people that come through 
Uh, and so I'm really delighted to be able to share with you today um, our recent work uh, where we've taken uh, DNA nanotechnology uh, into an era of precision medicine. And so my lab really studies how uh, organelle function uh, impacts cell function by mapping chemicals within organelle lumens. Uh, and to do this, we use a new uh, sort of chemical imaging technology that's based on DNA uh, that was invented by my lab. Uh, and this uh, technology basically uses short duplex uh, sequences of uh, DNA that act as fluorescent sensors for ions. And these sensors can be specifically targeted into organelles of cells. Now, for those of you who stopped thinking about living cells uh, from class eight, I'll just remind you that organelles in cells are just like organs of the body. Just like organs of the body perform specific functions for the body, organelles of cells perform very specific functions for cells. Uh, and because we can now measure chemicals inside organelles, uh, it gives us the ability to interrogate how organelles function uh, inside live cells and live organisms uh, in new and exciting ways. And our philosophy is that because we can now see chemicals that we always wanted to see in places of the cell that we could never access before, we must be able to uncover some new aspect of how the cell functions. And so using this technology, what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, a discovery where we've shown that we can now map the metabolic status of cells derived directly from human patients uh, with neurodegenerative diseases. And because of this, we can now subtype uh, different neurodegenerative diseases. We can measure patient responsivity to therapeutics, and we can assess disease severity. Uh, and so uh, in the last month, there have been four editorials in different nature journals uh, that have discussed now how DNA nanodevices has basically uh, entered the world of precision medicine. Uh, and therefore, it's a real privilege for me to talk about it for the first time uh, today here in this audience in front of close friends uh, that I've known for, for ages. Um, and so I want to also, uh, before I start, uh, thank the Infosys Science Foundation for organizing this lecture. Uh, and for the generous uh, hospitality and, and warmth uh, all of today, uh, interacting with uh, members of the chemistry department. It's really been a fabulous day today. So, uh, as I said, uh, when I, let me just introduce you a little bit to organelles of cells. Uh, and as a chemist, when I first looked at cells, when I was just transitioning from chemistry into biology, I wondered, you know, why does the cell have so many different compartments. Why does it, why should it have so many organelles? And so if, if you look at a, a cell which has so many different organelles, uh, you will see that each of these is actually a reaction vessel, right? Uh, and we know in our labs, uh, you can't use the same reaction conditions for so many different reactions. And each of these organelles is performing a different kind of reaction. And this demands a very different nature of reaction conditions. For example, in the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, amino acids are being stitched to form peptide bonds. Uh, in the Golgi, uh, amino acids, uh, they, uh, these proteins are being sort of glycosylated. Uh, in the lysosome, uh, 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 molecules are being degraded uh, into their constituent parts. In the peroxisome, uh, um, small, uh, long lipid chains are being peroxidized into smaller uh, chains. So you can see that the chemistry that's happening inside these organelle lumens is very, very different. And so over uh, evolutionary timescales, the ionic milieu uh, inside these organelles has been optimized to make sure that you can facilitate a particular kind of chemical reaction. And therefore, um, the ionic composition of an organelle is a sort of direct readout of the metabolic state and the metabolic function of the organelle. So you might want to think about this like uh, sort of gases that are being uh, that are coming out of your car uh, during an emission test, right? So as your car is being uh, uh, revved up uh, to different uh, performances, you know what is the kind of 
um, uh, you know what is the kind of uh, uh, gas levels that you should be seeing. And so in a similar way, uh, as, your, as your organelle is functioning, you have a certain level of chemicals that are being produced. And that basal level of chemicals at steady state is a reflection of the activity that's happening inside that organelle. And so if, if you measure the resting ion concentration inside these organelles, then you can get a direct readout of the metabolic status of the cell. And this is what I'm going to tell you about today. And the organelle today that I'm going to talk to you about is an organelle called the lysosome. Um, one second. I think this, yeah, is an organelle called the lysosome, which is here. And so the lysosome is unique because it contains at least 50 different enzymes that are all geared to cut up different kinds of uh, molecules that come in. Some cut up uh, lipids, some cut up proteins, some cut up sugars. Uh, and so all of these are usually called hydrolases. Uh, so the lysosome, uh, as I said, houses a bunch of uh, enzymes that are each geared to, uh, to cutting up specific kinds of substrates. And so um, the body, of course, you know, inside the cell, as your material gets obsolete, right? Uh, you have other organelles like peroxisomes, uh, you have uh, ribosomes. You have many of these uh, different parts are always functioning. And once they uh, uh, sort of complete their function uh, and they, they sort of run out and they become old, these kinds of obsolete cargo need to be degraded and recycled. And this is what is done by the lysosome. Why is the lysosome uh, becoming important? Uh, it's becoming important for two reasons. Uh, we are now finding more and more that whenever any one of these enzymes uh, have a genetic defect, you can't degrade a particular kind of material. And so this leads to a kind of disorder called uh, lysosomal storage disorder. These are rare genetic diseases, and they affect young children. Most of these diseases are neurological diseases. And so we have a collection, a whole collection of diseases uh, called lysosomal storage disorders, which are about uh, 70 such diseases, one for each enzyme that has gone bad. Um, and together, all of these lysosomal storage disorders number about one in 5,000 in humanity, right? This is of the countries that we know, um, but uh, it, the numbers could be larger. Uh, and so if you, so this is one system where a clear genetic defect can, it can be traced uh, to uh, you know, infants that have these neurological disorders. Uh, what is now becoming apparent is that the lysosome is also um, uh, defective in many common neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's, ALS. And these diseases affect elderly people. But again, the genetics in these cases is very diffuse, yet they're also neurological. And so uh, there is, uh, we now have two kinds of dysfunctions of the lysosome. One is a clear dysfunction, which is genetic, where you have clear mutations, and these affect young children. Uh, and then there are defects that I would call silent defects that take over in your old age, and these are also being uh, connected to the lysosome. Okay, and so I'm going to talk to you now about how we actually measure chemicals uh, inside cells, uh, and how we get our devices into the lysosome of cells to be able to look at the ionic level inside the lysosomes and understand is this cell a normal cell or is this cell lysosome uh, going kaput, right? Uh, and so your, your device would need to perform two functions if you are going to measure chemicals. So in this case, we are looking at measuring chemicals that are uh, very specific um, magnitudes. We don't want high, somewhat high, uh, low, somewhat low. We want to have numbers in terms of millimolar and micromolar. And so we can do this by measuring, uh, uh, if you take a simple DNA duplex, I think there is a problem at that end. Uh, if you take a simple DNA duplex and you have a dye that responds to a particular chemical that either glows in the presence of your chemical or gets shut off, so you can have either a turn on sensor or a turn off sensor, um, and you can hybridize it to another strand 
carrying a measuring uh, um, module or carrying a normalizing chemistry or a reference dye whose fluorescence doesn't change, then the ratio of this sensing dye to your reference dye gives you a clear number for this ion that you're measuring. And so because of this, let's say this dye glows green and this dye glows red, then you can basically go in a very color-coded fashion from green, lime green, lemon yellow, yellow, light orange, dark orange, red. And this should give you um, uh, a very clear indication as to the concentration of your ion. And so I've just described to you how from a DNA duplex, you can actually use a sensing module and a normalizing module to get to the concentration of your analyte in solution. The next thing is you need to be able to measure this ion concentration in millimolar or micromolar inside the cell's organelle. So you have to somehow put this device inside a cell's organelle. And so you, we do this by developing what's called an organelle targeting module that's going to bind a protein, and this protein is going to take it into the cell. How does that happen? So what we do is we define, if you want to send it to a particular organelle, what you do is you define on the organelle a particular protein called a shuttle protein. And a shuttle protein has two characteristics. One characteristic is it has a high abundance on your target organelle of interest and a low abundance on your plasma membrane. The second characteristic is there's an active exchange between these two populations. So I want you to think of if your target organelle is IIT Bombay, imagine you had free shuttles uh, in IIT Bombay that uh, go to the airport and come back, right? So at any one point of time, you have uh, a single shuttle uh, at your airport. And if you have the right ID card, you can hop onto it for free. And if you wait a little while, you end up in IIT Bombay. And if you, uh, if you have several such cycles, then you can basically enrich in IIT Bombay uh, those people who have identity cards of IIT Bombay, right? And so in the same way, if you now stick on molecular recognition motifs onto this DNA device and add it into solution outside, it basically latches onto the population at the plasma membrane and then gets ferried into your target organelle of interest. Okay. And so now, uh, what does this technology do? And why is this uh, a step forward? Uh, you know, chemists have made wonderful small molecules that can bind uh, and recognize very specifically and with great sensitivity a range of small molecules, a range of ions, right? We've all heard of ion sensitive dyes. Uh, the problem is that we don't have um, spatial resolution. So if you add uh, a ray of these small molecules to cells, you don't get spatial information, right? It basically covers the entire cell and paints the whole cell, right? So you get some low resolution picture of generally what your level of ion should be. The second is, we all have heard of fluorescent proteins. So green fluorescent protein, for example. If you take green fluorescent protein, you get exquisite spatial information you know exactly what part of the cell you're looking at. Only problem is you have no chemical information. It just tells you, here is your Golgi, or here is your lysosome. But it doesn't tell you what is the chemical environment inside. And so really what these DNA reporters do is that they combine the best of both worlds. They use the stable localization that is afforded to you by fluorescent proteins or macromolecules uh, localizes them inside an organelle, but at the same time, it can combine chemical information to be able to give you a magnitude and measure a chemical of interest inside uh, the organelle. And so the question then is, how do you actually measure? Uh, uh, how do you actually send these devices? We've, I've talked to you about a measuring module, and then I've, uh, I've said something about you have a molecular ticket. This molecular ticket can take you into an organelle, but the devil is in the detail, right? And how does this work? Uh, and so in one case, if you have receptors that are called endocytic receptors, every endocytic receptor has a ligand. 
So simply attach the endocytic ligand covalently to your DNA device, and you add your uh, DNA device carrying the ligand, it will engage your receptor and get inside your target organelle. In the second form, uh, DNA is an anionic molecule, and certain immune cells express a kind of receptor called a scavenger receptor. These scavenger receptors bind anionic molecules. And so because DNA is anionic, uh, it basically binds the scavenger receptor and gets sent, it gets targeted to your uh, organelle. And so, as I mentioned, uh, one of the receptors that we use is something called a scavenger receptor, which binds anything that's anionic, and DNA is anionic. So this is a receptor that's present on all immune cells. And so when a DNA device binds a scavenger receptor, it gets taken down a particular pathway called the endolysosomal pathway, and that, then this DNA device gets shuttled and ferried all the way to the lysosome. There are a bunch of other ways by which you can send DNA devices to other organelles where you can take a recombinant antibody and fuse it onto a shuttle protein. And so now the shuttle protein is carrying an artificial receptor for DNA on its back. Uh, as a result, uh, what happens is that you have um, uh, a DNA device that is, can bind very specifically only to this uh, particular receptor because it's an artificial receptor for DNA that's carried. Uh, why would one need this? Because many times, many of these uh, shuttle proteins are actually not receptors, so there is no ligand. And so this is a way by which you can get uh, uh, any device uh, into, um, uh, a, a shuttle into in, shuttled into an organelle, uh, the reason being that uh, you don't have to depend on chemistry here. So for example, uh, if your endocytic ligand somehow doesn't have the chemistry to functionalize your DNA, uh, or if you touch the endocytic ligand, it traffics in, in different ways, uh, then you can simply get on to using a, a synthetic receptor where you don't have to do the chemistry. Finally, uh, people have made all kinds of uh, aptamers to cell surface proteins. And many of these cell surface proteins uh, happen to be uh, shuttle proteins. And so if you're lucky, and there is a shuttle protein that, uh, um, that can bind your DNA device, uh, then, uh, uh, or, or your shuttle protein happens to have an aptamer, then you can simply take your DNA device, extend it to uh, include the sequence of the aptamer, and it can get uh, inside uh, your target organelle. And so what I'm going to talk to you about today uh, is really um, the use of DNA devices uh, into the lysosome, uh, where we label the lysosome using these ion sensors. Uh, we'll usually be using the scavenger receptor pathway because that's a very simple pathway that takes something to the lysosome. And what I'll talk to you about is the use of um, uh, 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 is the use of a chloride sensor called cleanser to um, measure the level of chloride uh, inside lysosomes. Um, and what we showed uh, using this chloride sensor is that the lysosome has extremely high chloride uh, inside its organelle. And this high chloride is really important uh, for the degradative function of the lysosome. So this was basic biology that was uncovered where we didn't know that the lysosome had so much chloride or that this chloride was actually useful for the function of the lysosome. In the second, we added one more layer of complexity on this system, and that was uh, we, in addition to chloride, we made a combination sensor using a DNA device so that we could measure both pH as well as chloride at the same time. Now, because we can measure two ions, we developed a technique called 2IM, or two-ion imaging. And using two-ion two ion imaging, we were able to measure uh, pH and chloride imbalances in lysosomes uh, of uh, skin biopsies uh, derived directly from patients with neurodegenerative disease. And this is what I want to talk to you about today. And so using this, we were able to find signatures that allow us to distinguish between a normal individual 
and an individual who has a neurodegenerative disease, where we could basically also look at the uh, responsivity to specific therapeutics. And finally, I want to talk to you about how we uh, were able to make a uh, DNA device that is uh, that solved the 30-year-old problem where people always wanted to measure calcium inside lysosomes but couldn't do so. And using this, we were able to identify the first example of a protein that imports calcium into the lysosome. Okay, so uh, in the first thing when I want to talk to you about this chloride sensor, uh, we basically used a, a strand of DNA that carries a, a chloride-sensitive dye called BAC, and this is hybridized to a DNA strand that carries a uh, fluorophore that glows red. Now, because of the stoichiometry of Watson and Crick base pairing, we have an exact one-is-to-one -one stoichiometry of ion-sensitive dye and ion-insensitive dye. Uh, we make everything a nice duplex DNA because this is a very good substrate to be recognized by the scavenger receptor. And so at high chloride, the fluorescence of this green dye decreases. And so the ratio of red to green will basically give you the concentration of your chloride ion. Uh, and so this was a dye that was developed by Sonawane uh, et al. Uh, and this is what we're using. Uh, and uh, predictably, we could get a very nice ratiometric chloride sensor where the ratio between this red and green uh, could simply tell you what was the concentration of chloride. And so the first thing that uh, um, Kasturi did, uh, which, who's my PhD student who, who, who solved this problem, uh, was to see if we could use chloride uh, to measure, uh, uh, a chloride sensor to measure chloride inside an organism called C. elegans, which is basically a nematode. Uh, and so this, uh, the sensor had been developed by a student called Sonali Saha, who had measured chloride inside lysosomes of cells in culture. But uh, Kasturi wanted to study uh, lysosome biology uh, inside an organism and to connect uh, chloride levels of lysosomes inside uh, a, an animal uh, where you would have dysfunction in the, in the lysosome and connect it to organism behavior. And so the system that she developed was the following, along with Sunaina, another graduate student. Uh, they showed that when they injected DNA devices into worms, these DNA devices were taken up by six specific cells called coelomocytes, because these coelomocytes were, expect, uh, were expressing scavenger receptors. They would bind these scavenger receptors and get ferried into the lysosome. And so DNA devices would nicely label lysosomes in this organism. Uh, you're going to see images like this. This is a single coelomocyte that has been labeled, uh, and we were able to show that uh, you can see these circles. These are, these are basically endosomes. These are the, the lysosomes here that are present inside the cell. So this is one cell, and that's a lysosome. Uh, and so what we were able to show was uh, you're going to see repeated images of things like this. So I'll just lead you through one image where... Uh, you take an image in the, in the red channel corresponding to the red normalizing dye and an image in the green channel corresponding to back, which is the ion sensitive dye. And now what you do is you divide every pixel uh, by the corresponding pixel in the red channel. That will give you a value that you can then convert into a color according to its magnitude. And therefore this literally gives you a heat map where if you have low chloride, you will see uh, your dots appear sort of blue. Uh, and if you have high chloride, uh, it goes more towards the red region. And so we were able to show that the device performs as well inside uh, 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 lysosomes that are present inside uh, C. elegans um, and uh, inside a glass cuvette. Uh, which basically means that this device is performing an independent function inside a living organism. You don't have anything interfering with its function. And so what uh, Kasuri then said was to, was to say, okay, now that we can measure chloride in lysosomes, can we look at this in some kind of a disease model? So the disease that she, she chose was a disease called osteopetrosis. We made a model of this disease in C. elegans, where there were very specific genes if you mutate uh, leads to osteopetrosis. Uh, and there were control genes which, if you mutate, doesn't give you osteopetrosis. And what she found was the following. Um, one of the genes that uh, is mutated which causes osteopetrosis is a chloride channel called CLC7. 
So if you mutate CLC7, chloride values should drop because this worm is now diseased. And what she found was that um, uh, for all the genes that were involved in osteopetrosis, it resulted in low chloride. Uh, these are control genes which have nothing to do with uh, osteopetrosis, but have very similar functions on other parts of the cell. So these are control genes and you do not expect chloride values to fall. The interesting thing is that uh, um, in this particular disease, it's very specific to chloride dysfunction. So here you will see that pH has not changed at all, uh, but chloride values have actually changed. And so having validated this the, uh, chloride sensor in this particular disease model, she then wanted to ask, what does uh, this defective chloride actually do? So one of the functions of lysosomes, as I told you, is to degrade material. So Sunaina came up with this interesting um, uh, idea a, a long time ago where she was actually looking at the stability of these DNA devices because these, this is also biological material which is eaten up by an immune cell that then needs to be degraded. Uh, and so what she was able to show was she developed a method by which she could look at the half-life of this DNA device once it entered inside uh, a cell. And so Kasturi then decided to leverage this and then ask whether uh, if you take a DNA device, which is the natural substrate for these immune cells, and look at the uh, capacity of the cell to degrade these devices, then uh, you will get a certain half-life. And so she found that the half-life was about six hours or so. Uh, so the first, in the first pass, the moment the cell, the device enters the lysosome, it will give you a reading of chloride. And then thereafter, over a longer time scale, the lysosome is actually degrading your DNA. And so she said, well, let me take a look at, uh, in a disease model, what happens to the lysosome's capacity to degrade the device after the device has reported on chloride concentration. And what she found was the following, that uh, when she looked at uh, the half-life of these DNA devices, and she looked at the chloride level, she found that the more of the chloride was, that is, the more uh, compromised the level of chloride, that is, the lesser the level of chloride, the longer was the half-life of the DNA. And so what that meant was that chloride was essentially the teeth of the lysosome. So the less chloride, the more difficult it was for the lysosome to degrade the device. So we were compromising the capacity of your lysosome to degrade material by reducing the chloride in the lysosome. And so then she asked a, a very simple question, which is that if you have high chloride, you have good degradation. If you compromise chloride, you have low degradation. But I spoke to you about these lysosomal storage disorders where there is huge amount of storage, where we know that lysosome uh, uh, capacity to degrade is, is, is gone, right? And so what happens to the chloride level in those disease conditions. And so she chose a variety of diseases, Kasturi, and measured chloride and pH values in many of these uh, uh, models. What she found was the following, that lysosomal diseases fell into three categories. One, where only pH was disrupted, chloride was fine. One, where chloride was fine, but pH was disrupted. And many of them, for which earlier people had only said that pH was uh, dysregulated, we also found that chloride was dysregulated by much higher levels. So this now meant that instead of, in addition to looking at pH as a diagnostic or as a sensor for uh, looking at these cells uh, from these various disease models uh, to find out if they, had, if they were defective, we could also use chloride because it shows much higher sensitivity. Okay. So then what we decided to do was to ask, this is fine, it's all in worms. Uh, how about mammals uh, and, uh, and, and cells that are uh, in mammals that are also uh, affected with lysosomal diseases? So we chose two diseases, Neiman Pick AB disease as well as Gaucher disease. And what we uh, did was we added chemicals that are known to inhibit uh, these specific enzymes that cause these diseases. So this is called a drug-induced model uh, inside uh, higher organisms. 
and we found that uh, essentially we got the same results, that you could capture changes in chloride as well as changes in pH uh, for uh, two lysosomal disorders that we could model uh, in, in cell culture. So this now brings me to uh, uh, the second part of the talk, which is uh, actually taking this now uh, into human patients. So what we then did was to say, OK, since pH is misregulated and chloride is misregulated, can we try and sense both ions at the same time? And so we came up with a device where in this, using these two dyes, we could sense uh, pH change. Uh, because if you change the acidity to higher acidity, this, uh, this C-rich strand here folds up into an I motif. This results in FRET that gives you a ratiometric um, readout uh, of, of uh, pH. And so orange and the ratio of orange and green, um, uh, that is a donor and an acceptor, will give you uh, a response as a function of pH. And the ratio of red to green, which is what you saw um, um, uh, earlier for cleanser, uh, will give you a value for chloride. And what we showed was these two models, uh, these two modules of sensing, the pH sensitive module can sense pH irrespective of chloride concentration. Uh, the, the performance characteristics are the same. And the same is true for chloride. The capacity for this, this system to sense chloride uh, is the same at every pH. So these two modules are independent of each other. And so what you're going to see is the following. When we added these uh, uh, two cells derived from a normal human, uh, and we just measured, looked at every lysosome, and measured pH and chloride values for every lysosome with single lysosome resolution. That means I can look at this lysosome and say, aha, the pH value is this much, and the chloride value in the same lysosome is this much. And so you can plot, this is about 600 lysosomes from about 30 cells, but you'll see that each point here is defined, is corresponds to a single lysosome, where uh, this corresponds to the pH value, and this corresponds to the chloride value. And you'll see that this is a scatter. And so to represent this more clearly, we converted this into a density plot, where the more red it is, the higher the number of values that you have in this point, and the more blue it is, the, le the more sparsely represented. And so you'll see that there are actually two populations, one higher population and uh, a slightly lower population, but this population has a much higher amount of chloride, right? And so we said, okay, let's take a look at uh, how this looks like uh, in a bunch of different people. So these are three normal people, and what you'll see is all of them have this high chloride population. Uh, if we took uh, samples from patients that had Neiman-Pick disease, so these are uh, patients that have, there are three different varieties of Neiman-Pick disease. There's Neiman-Pick A, Neiman-Pick B, and Neiman-Pick C. And so this is what you'll see, that all of them lost this high chloride population. It's just completely missing. And so we said, OK, this is interesting. Uh, let's try and see what happens if we add a therapeutic to this. Now, what's interesting is uh, Neiman pick A and Neiman pick B uh, are due to the lack of a certain enzyme called acid sphingomyelinase. So the therapeutic is to add this enzyme back to the system. Uh, and when you do that, uh, you see that this high chloride population comes back for the Neiman pick uh, AB patients. Okay. Uh, the second is uh, Neiman pick C, for which there is no approved therapeutic. They're just trying to get one therapeutic now into clinical trials. Their clinical trials are right now underway, but we know that this is not a very good therapeutic. Uh, but because of patient advocacy, they are trying to push this uh, through, right? Uh, and you'll see why it's a bad therapeutic. So this patient, for example, responded reasonably well. This patient, there's absolutely no response. And this patient also is sort of borderline, right? Uh, and so you can actually now envisage uh, in clinical trials 
you, you can put people through the clinical trial and you can follow them using uh, this technology and you'll be able to provide an explanation as to why certain patients uh, responded to a therapeutic or not. This allows you to distill out patient cohorts for clinical trials. It allows you to assess whether a person will be responsive to the drug before you put them on the drug. Uh, why is this important? Because just to give you some uh, perspective, uh, if you are um, uh, unfortunate enough to have neiman pick A disease or B disease, the cost of that therapeutic uh, comes up to about $250,000 a year uh, to be on this drug. And people are not sure whether it was going to work for you or not. So this is one way by which one can check uh, well beforehand to be able to see whether it's worthwhile to be on this therapeutic or not. Um, and so what is this high chloride population which is disappearing and then reappearing? What is it doing? Uh, uh, and so what uh, Kasuri found was the following. Uh, for the lysosome to function, it needs to be able to accumulate calcium as well as release calcium. This is one of the basic functions of a lysosome. And so what she found was the following, that uh, when you uh, trigger calcium release, what you can do is you can add a chemical. That chemical will open up a channel on this balloon of calcium. Uh, and that is going to release calcium, which you can catch using a calcium-sensitive dye in the cytosol. So this is what a normal lysosome looks like. Boom, you have a huge puff of calcium that comes out. And you can see a large amount of calcium that has been released. Uh, if you drop chloride deliberately, you add a chemical that uh, prevents the enrichment of chloride inside a lysosome, and you now add calcium, you see a very small amount of chloride when you puncture that balloon. Uh, and so what this says is that if you drop chloride levels uh, inside the lysosome, uh, you also compromise the capacity of the lysosome to release calcium. So one aspect of the lysosome is, uh, is compromised. The second is the following. The lysosome also has a bunch of enzymes that are degraders, right? And so what she did was she took uh, uh, cells that uh, had their lysosomes marked with two kinds of dyes. One is a dye called lysotracker, which stains any acidic compartment. And these lysosomes are highly acidic. You puncture a lysosome, it's going to leak out protons. Acidity will drop, OK? Uh, the second is you can also add a chemical uh, called a, a polymer called dextran that is also just going to be sitting inside. It can't leak out, but it's just going to show you that there is a lysosome that's present. It's not that the lysosome has completely dissolved or broken up. It's still there, but it's just punctured, OK? So you're going to see TMR dextran in green, and you're going to see lysotracker in red. Because uh, they are both uh, in the same place at the same time, you're going to see yellow. If your lysosomal enzymes are working, when you add a substrate called GPN, if GPN gets nicely cut, it's going to cause pores on the lysosome. That means your lysotracker is going to escape. Uh, it's going to not stain because your lysosome has got punctured. All the protons have left. Your, li your lysosome has become very basic. So lysotracker won't be able to stain this anymore. But your TMR dextran is going to be inside. And what she basically showed was that if you uh, dropped uh, chloride, if you somehow prevented the entry of chloride into the lysosome, it resulted in, sorry about the graphics, but it's better to have this than uh, uh, disco light type uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> or MTV type uh, video. Uh, but anyway, so what she was able to show was that the moment you, um, you dropped chloride, it prevented the capacity of lysosomes to cut up GPN. So this was very important for the function of certain lysosomal enzymes, not all lysosomal enzymes. So chloride was doing two things. It was regulating the, the capacity of the lysosome to release calcium. It was also preventing uh, the function of specific lysosomal enzymes to degrade. OK. And so finally, uh, what I want to talk to you about was, uh, uh, is this device, which is uh, uh, 
uh, a method by which you can actually measure calcium inside lysosomes. So having done this, uh, uh, done this project to find out what uh, uh, chloride was doing to the lysosome, uh, why this high chloride population was important, we realized one thing, that we could not measure calcium inside the lysosome. We could only measure calcium that was released into the cytosol. And I asked uh, Kasturi, why don't we measure calcium inside the lysosome uh, and see whether it's a problem with defective uptake of calcium or defective release of calcium? And then, to my surprise, she came back to me and said, there's no method by which you can measure calcium inside the lysosome. And I said, this is ridiculous because it's so important to function. Are you saying that biologists haven't figured out a way to measure calcium inside lysosomes? Uh, and then we went back and looked at uh, uh, literature and we found that for 30 years, people have been wanting to measure calcium inside lysosomes. They just could not do it. And so what they were able to only do was to see how much calcium is released into the cytosol. Why is this the case? And so uh, it turns out uh, the, the follow, uh, that it's uh, the following problem, that you have organelles inside the cell that are slightly acidic that also contain calcium, for example, lysosomes and Golgi. Uh, and inside the lysosome, you can have calcium uh, coming in by... Um, they are, re they are released by calcium channels that the moment they open, calcium leaks out. But somebody has to put this calcium in, right? So you should also be able to look at importers. It turns out that we cannot look at importers. I can look at releasers because I can block a channel and I can measure in the cytosol and see, uh, you know, that uh, calcium is not coming out. So I can address the function of all these guys. But in order to assess the function of importers, whoever is bringing in calcium, I have to keep my calcium sensor inside the lysosome. And I cannot sense calcium inside uh, the lysosome for the simple reason that all calcium dyes are pH sensitive. So every one of these calcium dyes, uh, for example, here's, here's one uh, example of a calcium dye. They are pH sensitive because they coordinate calcium through protonatable carboxylic acids. At the same time, this nitrogen, uh, this nitrogen here, uh, is actually quenching uh, this fluorophore by photo-induced electron transfer. So the moment this gets uh, protonated, or if it gets engaged in a calcium complex, then uh, this fluorophore lights up, right? So this is why it's a, pH, it's a calcium sensor, but it's also a pH sensor. So now if you're sitting inside an organelle which is acidic, I don't know whether it's going to report calcium or it's reporting pH. As a result, if biologists see an acidic compartment, they will never measure calcium in that. Uh, and so this has been a problem that has, been <laughs> that has lasted 30 years. Uh, and so we wondered, well, we have a pH sensor, right? And so if we attach now a calcium sensor to this system, if we know exactly how this calcium sensor uh, response changes as a function of pH as well as calcium. And if it's sitting inside a compartment like the lysosome, I can measure pH in the same place using this method as I showed you earlier. And if I take this ratio, then I know what is the value of pH. I know what is the value of calcium plus pH. So if I in introduce a pH correction factor, then I can get the value of calcium absolute, right? And so that was the approach which we took. So you can see again that the pH sensing module here is completely independent of the calcium concentration, right? But the calcium sensitivity is, is actually dependent on pH. But we have a function, uh, a surface, that we can actually define by an equation, right? So we know exactly how the function of this uh, is going to change, the responsibility of this uh, dye is going to change as a function of calcium at different pH values. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, what we are going to add one more layer of complexity. So here is the same coelomocyte. We've imaged it in the donor channel and the acceptor channel. So let's come here, uh, let's come here. So, uh, 
So we're going to look at it in the donor channel and the acceptor channel, and this is going to give you a value of pH. If you look at it in the uh, calcium sensitive dye channel, which is this orange channel, and the red channel, which is your reference dye, this O by R is going to give you a measure of calcium plus pH, right? And so the key is I need to find out out here exactly what the pH is and then find out what is the calcium value here. So here's how you do this. Here's, a, here's real data. So I told you how to get a D by A map. We already know that the D by A map uh, has a sigmoidal dependence. There's an equation for this. You plug this in and you can get the value of pH. No problem. This is what I was telling you about earlier. We also know exactly how the KD of this dye changes for calcium, changes as a function of pH. And that goes something like this. So you can basically plug in an equation that at every pH, you can convert this into a value for KD, right? The second is, you now have your O by R map. This KD is basically a KD corrected map that you can then plug in your value uh, here of which is your pH correction factor. I agree that uh, this is a bit complicated, but it's just an equation which you can just plug in. And using this, you can get the value of absolute calcium. And so the reason why I'm taking a little bit of time to tell you this is that uh, this is the first calcium map of acidic lysosomes of any acidic compartment inside the cell. Uh, and it was only made possible for the following reason. See, pH-sensitive dyes have been around for 50 years. Calcium-sensitive dyes have been around for about 40 years, uh, you know, thanks to Roger Chen. Uh, we have known about endocytosis and endocytic tracers now for 50 years, longer than I have been alive. But it took a simple DNA duplex to be able to take all of these functions and put them on one device and make it precise to be able to get to a calcium map. And so what we then did was to look at uh, calcium values as a function of endosomal maturation. So we looked at uh, calcium values as the DNA device was transiting from the early endosome to the late endosome to the lysosome, and this is called the endolysosomal pathway. We were able to show that uh, calcium values are fairly low in the early and late endosome, but suddenly in the lysosome, there was a 30-fold increase in calcium. And the question then was, who is bringing in this calcium? Uh, we were found that there were no known importers uh, of calcium in the literature. And so what we did was we said, OK, let's see, let's take a look at um, the, let's take a look at the proteome of the, of the lyso human lysosomal proteome. Uh, where by mass spectrometry, they basically have a set of every single protein that's present on the lysosome, and ask which of these proteins looks like the best known calcium importer that we know of. And the best known calcium importer is a protein called CIRCA, which is present on the endoplasmic reticulum. And we found about eight of these guys resembling CIRCA. And I really liked this guy here called CATP6. And so what we then did was to show um, using a whole worm assay uh, where we looked at three phenotypes. One is a whole worm phenotype where the worm either lives or dies. The second is a phenotype in terms of lysosomes inside the coelomocyte. That is, uh, it's either huge or it's a normal size. And the third is an intralysosomal phenotype which is, or chemotype, which is the level of calcium here. What we showed was... Um, there's a very, very well-known calcium releasing channel called CUP5. If you delete CUP5 in worms, uh, the worm dies. Uh, if you RNAi it out, uh, there's a defect in degradation, so the lysosomes will become very huge. Uh, and the calcium values will be very high. Because if you block calcium, calcium, it's like a pressure cooker, right? Calcium values are going to increase quite a bit. So what we were then able to show is that by deleting CATP6, which is a lysosomal calcium importer, it functionally opposes CUP5. So that is whatever CUP5 is doing, if, this, if your gene is going, to, is going to do the opposite function, 
Your worm, which was lethal, should now survive if you knock this out. Your lysosomes should be set back to normal and your calcium values should come back to normal. In that case, this gene, whichever has been deleted, is doing the exact opposite function of this releaser. That means it is importing. And that was exactly what we found. The worms that were normally dying came back to life. Uh, the, there was enhanced survival. The size of the lysosomes now came back to normal. This is what normal looks like. And at the same time, the calcium values, so if you delete an importer, your calcium values should increase. If you delete uh, a releaser, your calcium values should um, increase. And if you delete both, your calcium values should be normalized. And so we showed that this really facilitates lysosomal calcium accumulation. We then also showed that uh, in patients, so what does ATP, what does this CATP6 do? The human analog of CATP6 is a protein called ATP13A2, 32, which is also PARC9. It is a Parkinson's risk gene. And people didn't know what this gene does. What we were able to show was that uh, by measuring calcium levels in normal individuals, uh, such as here, you see normal levels of calcium. And if you take skin biopsies from patients with kufour rakab syndrome, and these are patients, uh, kufour rakab syndrome is nothing but uh, um, a very early onset, very uh, uh, severe form of Parkinson's disease that affects male patients. Uh, so these are uh, male patients, three male patients that have uh, a specific mutation uh, where this C is converted to T, and this results in uh, uh, ATP13A2 dysfunction. It's basically not, there's no ATP13A2 present on these lysosomes. What we found was the calcium values had dropped dramatically. So now we were able to find out a function for this particular Parkinson's risk gene that people did not know earlier. Um, and so with this, I'm going to, uh, to stop and, and uh, just tell you that uh, using a simple chloride sensor where we just wanted to ask a very simple question, which is, what is the value of chloride in lysosomes? Uh, we found that lysosomes had extremely high chloride. Uh, this high chloride was very important for their function. Uh, and uh, because this high chloride was also very sensitive to... Uh, changes in lysosome uh, integrity, uh, we could use it to map um, uh, the status of lysosomes in uh, human fibroblasts from normal as well as uh, disease patients, and basically able to look at uh, responsivity of your cells to a very specific therapeutic. Uh, and finally, I showed you one example of how you can use this for discovery biology. Um, uh, with this, I am going to uh, stop and acknowledge a very fantastic group. I would normally have had everybody's faces uh, uh, and, uh, and, and things that they were doing. Um, so uh, Sonali was the one who developed this chloride sensor along with Ved Prakash. Uh, Kasturi has done uh, a lot of the work in C. elegans, finding out this unusual role of chloride. Um, finding out that, uh, uh, that the identity of this lysosomal calcium importer. And she worked very closely with Kaho, uh, who is uh, there, um, and uh, Anand, uh, who is out there. Uh, so with, along with Anand and Kaho, they came up with this method, uh, this uh, mathematical method to map uh, uh, lysosomal calcium. Uh, We've had uh, wonderful collaborations with uh, physics students, uh, uh, interns. Uh, um, Sunena set up a lot of this work uh, in C. elegans. Um, we collaborate a lot. Uh, some of the, the, uh, the fibrobl patient fibroblasts that we got were from, uh, were from uh, the Northwestern University uh, Feinberg School of Medicine that has a really good uh, collection of uh, uh, skin biopsies from patients with neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, and uh, Nagarjun was the person who made uh, the, this uh, calcium dye. Um, and I think uh, for the work that I spoke about, uh, these are the people who contributed. 
uh, but the team is highly interdisciplinary and uh, we uh, really cherish the fact that we have both geneticists, uh, microbiologists, biochemists, physicists, uh, and chemists all working together in just one lab. And it's really interesting to see uh, how they try to uh, get past syntax error uh, and uh, work productively to actually solve a problem. So with this, I'll, I'll take any questions. And once again, apologies for uh, the uh, slight uh, 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 mishap during the uh, uh, early part of the talk. Thank you for your patience. Uh, any questions? Yes. So yes. I just said that is a, you showed that the lyso tracker is yes. binding to a pH sensitive uh, organelle and all that. So yes. Is it irreversible binding or is it a reversible binding? Because it's it's reversible. So in fact, what lyso tracker does is it basically has a moiety that gets protonated and it's also carrying a fluorophore. So if your organelle is highly acidic, then the dye basically comes, gets protonated, and stays inside the lysosome. So. Uh, that's why your lysosome will then glow, because it has a very high concentration of this fluorescent uh, product, right? The moment uh, the pH of the lysosome uh, increases, that is, becomes more neutral, your dyes will slowly get deprotonated, and they will now leave the lysosome. So the intensity of the fluorophore in the lysosome will be low. Uh, and so that's a reversible process. Hi, here. Yes. Hi, very nice talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you to elaborate a little bit about this uh, dual sensing, the pH and the calcium. Yes. The reason I am saying is because uh, the concentration of the uh, uh, of your device yes. seen by the pH yes. sensor is different from what is seen for the calcium because uh, there will be some protonated OHs, I guess, for so they sure. are not being able to see that. Yes. So can you elaborate a little bit about yes, it? Yes, for sure. So uh, let me just... Um, so uh, the thing is, you uh, the important thing about this particular um, system, right, is that you have a one is to one is to one ratio of all of these dyes, right? Uh, so when the pH changes, this guy is going to fold up, and you'll have fret between this green and red. Uh, this dye is going to be sensitive to both pH as well as calcium, right? And so uh, it has a particular response at a pH 7 and a different response at pH 5. Two things will change. This fold change will be different, and the KD will be different. You can represent, if I know the pH value, so what you're doing is at every lysosome, you're going to get the D by A value, which is going to give you your pH, but you'll also get the O by R value, right? This O by R value you can first decide where on this axis you're going to be looking at, right? And so from the first D by A value that you get, I will say, okay, I'm looking at this part of the curve, or I'm looking at that part of the curve. Knowing this and the fold change that you have and the response that you have, you can calculate what is your, um, the component that is due to calcium increase. I can explain it to you a little, little later. One has to also look at this entire fold change. Uh, yeah. Yes. Hello, ma'am. Nice talk. I just wanted to ask about uh, one more parameter. Yes. The effect of uh, intracellular temperature uh, on the calcium binding and the stability of the fluorescence. Super. Uh, intracellular temperature. Yes. yes. So um, this is something which uh, uh, one as there is an assumption that we make. The assumption that we make is uh, throughout the cell, the temperature is 37 degrees centigrade. Right. Uh, we don't know whether there are temperature inhomogeneities inside the cell, right? Even till today. But we all have to make some assumptions, uh, and this is the assumption that we make. Because uh, fluorescence is uh, 
also affected by this for thing. sure yes for sure uh, but you know you would start seeing uh, differences if you have say plus f- minus 5 degrees then you can start seeing the question is how much difference is it going to make right um, and so all of these things are not absolute values but for sure they are uh, uh you have to take them with some level of uh, you know uh, fuzziness uh, uh, as with biology um and if you look at you know in our own body we have uh, different regions of our body have different temperatures uh and the level of temperature difference as i understand it is about 2 degrees uh our internal organs are a slightly different temperature than uh, other places so i don't anticipate very huge differences you know Uh, i had a question yes. can we conjugate these uh, sensors to live bacteria and track the vacuolar <laughs> ionic composition yes, of bacteria yes we have a paper this? yes absolutely we have a paper this month uh, in nature chemical biology in asap where we've done exactly this we've taken dna devices stuck them on uh, bacteria uh, and yeast uh, and been able to map reactive species in the phagosome uh, Yeah. Hey, Jovan, a very nice work. Thank you. I was wondering yes. about uh, uh, when you talked about these patient cells that yes. you have taken. Yes. Yes. Uh, you showed some images to us. Yes. But uh, is there cell to cell variability, and what yes. is the extent of the cell to cell variability, even for let's say one patient or one That's subset? That's such a super you, question. Uh, yeah. People, I did not plant this question. Uh, uh, so these are. three different uh patient th- not in the three different normal individual three different healthy individuals and you will see it's not exactly the same but you can you can set your you can you can set a a bar and 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 take a look at this where i really thought that you know we are sitting on something uh quite amazing is the following uh we took these cells from repositories okay uh you can just write to a repository and they will send you uh patient cells that have been characterized and so uh, uh we got this kind of a pattern for patient number 1 who has neiman pick a uh then kaho uh did a num- couple of other uh tests for neiman pick b uh and the difference between neiman pick a and b is only the following uh the same protein is mutated okay it's the same gene that's mutated in neiman pick a it's mutated so badly that activity is below 5% neiman pick b same protein is has a mild mutation so there's some activity so when we looked at neiman this neiman pick b patient i said you know kaho these two look very similar uh what is this uh and can we get information from this guy uh so turns out that uh, uh this person has the same mutation it's l302p as this person right and then i said you know but why is it neiman pick b and not a can we get more information turns out that this uh you can only diagnose neiman pick a or b based on whether it's manifested neurologically which is a or manifested viscerally right as well as enzyme test assay percentage of activity uh when we looked at the information that was given uh turns out that this is 21 fetal weeks you tell me how can you diagnose a or b whether it's manifesting in the brain or viscerally in a fetus then why was it classified as b because they take the cells they crush it up and they assay for enzyme activity and interestingly you can have maternal contribution if you're taking it from the fetus how can you say this enzyme came didn't come from the mother right Uh, and so there would have been a higher level of activity and that was when i realized that here we are basically now taking the cells we are culturing it and we are measuring inside the lysosome not you know external stuff that's coming from external uh, sources uh, and so you're basically getting a very accurate reading so this actually tells you that i have it's the same defect and i'm actually able to see it's almost like a protein folding problem right you have this protein folding funnel Uh, and i press it in one way and it goes this way i press make another perturbation i press it another way it goes the other way 
So it's a, uh, it's a set point uh, that shifts the landscape of uh, ions to certain set values because of the nature of the perturbation. So if you give a designer perturbation twice, uh, you, can, you can get that. Yeah. We'll take the last question.